my name is Eastman, and um, my bachelor's degree would tell you that I'm a composer, and my website would tell you that I'm a sound artist, and occasionally I'm able to convince people that I'm an academic. Um, but I would tell you that I'm a musiker, and that's not a grammatical error. Uh, that's a term that I'm borrowing from a man named Christopher Small, who wrote a lovely little book called Musicking. You'll see here an image of myself and my dog, and I happen to be holding the book. Um, a lot of Christopher Small's theories that are presented in this book are grounded in the idea that music is a verb and not a noun. Uh, I'm not a stickler for grammar, but I do believe that music is a verb and not a noun. Or at the very least, I believe that it's advantageous for us to think of it that way. So during this talk, I will do so. Uh, I'll now read you Christopher Small's definition of musicking uh, to clear up some of these ideas. So to music is, quote, to take part in any capacity in a musical performance, whether by performing, by listening, by rehearsing or practicing, by providing material for performance, or by dancing. Small goes on to write, we might at times even extend this definition to the hefty men who move the piano and the drums before the gig, the cleaners who clean up after the gig, and those who take the tickets. He goes on to describe a bunch of different roles. The effect of applying this theory to music is a kind of leveling of the playing field of the different things you could do when you are musicking. So listening, or taking tickets, or cleaning is just as much musicking as performing or composing. So that's kind of the ideas that are grounding me in this talk. Uh, I'm going to start now by giving you a criminally brief history of listening technology. Um, as is the case with the rest of my talk, this history is going to focus on the English-speaking Western world, because that's the world that I know and the world that I've researched. There are very rich histories of listening elsewhere in the world, but I'm not the one who should be talking about them. Um, so from the dawn of time uh, until about the mid-1800s, Music was something that you had to hear or see live. You had to be in the right place at the right time in order to experience it. Uh, then in the mid-1800s, with the emergence of the middle class and a widening of music tuition and education and availability of things like piano reductions, when an orchestral piece would be reduced to a piano score, and the availability of musical instruments for those who had it within their means to purchase them, music was no longer just a thing that you had to be in the right place at the right time in order to experience. It was something that you either had to be in the right place at the right time in order to experience, or you had to own the right things and know people who knew what to do with them or know what to do with them yourself. Then, in the early 1900s, uh, you could finally buy recordings of music, right, with the dawn of uh, recording technology. So this meant that you no longer had to be in the right place at the right time. You just had to own the right thing and be in the right place, right? Then, in the 1980s, uh, with the invention of the Walkman and later the Discman, you could finally take some of your music in the form of cassettes or CDs uh, with you anywhere you wanted. So you no longer had to be in the right place. Uh, you could be anywhere you wanted. Then, um, in the late, uh, late 1990s and the early 2000s, with the invention of the MP3 player, you could effectively take all of your music anywhere you wanted, right? Then today, with smartphones and streaming technologies, you can effectively take all of anybody's music wherever you want. So the effect is that our, our listening to music has become unchained and untethered, and we're no longer tied to places. We're no longer tied to people to experience music. We're no longer even tied to certain possessions or, or uh, purchases, right? So the next thing that I'm going to do is give uh, a brief summary of some ideas and my interpretation of those ideas, and I'm getting these ideas from Jacques Derrida. I can feel that we all just tensed up a little bit when I mentioned that name, and that's for good reason. Uh, we, we heard Jess earlier talk about um, kind of the aggressiveness or the alienation that uh, happens when we use academic language, um, but I'm going to try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, I'm getting these ideas from a work called Signature Event Context, written by Derrida that was first published in the book Limited Inc. As you can see, uh, I had to return this book to the library before I took these pictures, so we're left with just a picture of myself and my dog. Um, and so, for the sake of uh, clarity and time, uh, the example that I'm going to explain to illustrate some of these points uh, is going to focus around a wedding ceremony, okay? So let's, for the sake of argument, uh, just imagine that we're all practicing Christians who believe in the sanctity of marriage and its relationship to the church. Bear with me. This is, this is going to be relevant, I know. 
I know it's an unfortunate example. Um, so so we're, all, we're all practicing Christians who believe in the sanctity of marriage and its relationship to the church, uh, and I am a priest, okay? And I am tasked with marrying the two of you, if I, if I can be so bold. Okay, so let's say that it's, okay, I can see you're enjoying it a little bit, that's good. Um, so let's say that it's two days before the big wedding, right? And the three of us are uh, seated in a pub, and I'm explaining how the ceremony's going to go. And I say, yeah, da 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 yeah, da 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 this, this, and this, I do, I do, I now pronounce you man and wife. So that doesn't marry you. So, Derrida argues, the words themselves don't actually mean anything. I said I now pronounce you man and wife, but that didn't make you married. Let's say it's the next day, and it's the day before the big day, and we're in the church with everybody here, and everybody who's going to see the wedding is gathered, um, and we're standing up there at the altar. I'm wearing um, whatever it is a priest wears, and uh, I say to the two of you, this is how the ceremony is going to go, yeah, da 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 yeah, da 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 I do, I do, I now pronounce you man and wife. So that didn't even marry you. So Derrida argues, it's not the text, the words themselves don't mean anything, and it's not the context, it's not the place where these things happen. Now, on the big day, where we've all agreed that you're going to get married, and we're standing up there at the altar, and I say, yeah, da 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 yeah, da 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 I have a pretty creative, you know, uh, approach to wedding ceremonies. And so I do, I do. I now pronounce you man and wife, that does marry you. So, Derrida argues, it is the event that is the custodian of meaning, that creates meaning. It's not the words themselves, it's not where we hear the words or where we say the words, it's the event that takes place that is the custodian of meaning. I think that was relatively painless, maybe. Um, Luckily, I'm not the only person that attempts to apply these ideas to music. Uh, Tia Denora is a great uh, musicologist who wrote uh, this book, Music in Everyday Life, that talks about um, applying this kind of uh, semiotic, a big big word, but that's that's what we just talked about, just that idea, um, to music, right? And so I'm going to use, for another example, I'm going to use the American National Anthem. Another subpar example, but it'll it'll function for what we're doing. So I'm I'm sure that we're all uh, familiar with the National Anthem of America, the Star Spangled Banner. The beginning uh, goes a little something like this. Uh, yeah, da 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 da, right? Something like that. Great. So, um, <laughs> Tia, <laughs> it's a great performance. Um, so, Tia Denora argues that there is nothing inherently patriotic, there's nothing inherently American, there's nothing inherently nationalistic about those notes in that order, right? It is only through repeated listenings to that piece of music that we make meaning out of it. So, uh, a lot of Americans might tell you, oh, the National Anthem is a great, very American song. It's a very nationalistic song. It's a very uh, patriotic song. But that's really only because they've listened to it so many times while looking at a flag, hand held over their heart, the other hand holding a hot dog, getting ready to enjoy a baseball game. Um, I myself tend to think of bowling when I hear the National Anthem because I've been at many more bowling events than baseball events. Um, I also think of... Jimi Hendrix's 1969 performance of the National Anthem at Woodstock. I think of Whitney Houston's uh, recording of the National Anthem. Lately, I've been walking around London. Uh, the, the other day, I walked past Westminster, and I was listening to Duke Ellington's performance of the Star Spangled Banner uh, live at the Newport 1953. And the idea that I'm trying to talk about today is that that's a fairly new uh, development. Me being able to walk around a city where I am not a citizen, uh, not owning the record but listening to it on a whim, uh, and creating these kind of new associations and new meanings uh, as I listen to these pieces of music in events, as we've described earlier, right? Um, And it's great because it feels as though our technology has finally caught up with our ideas about music. So as I said before, we're finally able to listen anywhere, at any time, really to anything, for the most part. And we have these ideas that are about making meaning in events and things not having a meaning in themselves. The words themselves don't mean anything. The context doesn't mean anything. It's the event where meaning is created. And we can now have listening events anywhere, at any time. The problem is that this is not how people talk about music today, for the most part. If we look at uh, music critics, if we look at music education today, if we look at even performers of music, that's not the way that people talk about music. And I'd like to describe the way that they do talk about music and what I think some problems with that are. And so I'm going to use the example of Theodore Adorno and uh, the composer Arnold Schoenberg. Um, Theodore Adorno was a German philosopher who notably hated jazz uh, and also thought that serialist composition 
um, what I think is the most boring form of music, uh, was God's gift to society. And Arnold Schoenberg uh, was a serialist composer. Um, he may still be, for all I know. Um, and so Theodore Adorno wrote at great length about Arnold Schoenberg. Um, he wrote these incredible things about how the, the way that Arnold Schoenberg organized 12-tone rows uh, mimicked and critiqued the way that society itself was organized at the time. I think, I didn't read it, um, he might have said that, I don't know. But, um, but he said all these great things about Arnold Schoenberg's music, but the problem with how he talked about and wrote about Arnold Schoenberg's music was that he wrote about it in such a way that you could understand everything you need to know about Schoenberg's music just by looking at a score, right? And that you could read Arnold Schoenberg's music and understand everything about how he was organizing it. And so listening was never actually a part of how Theodore Adorno talked about Arnold Schoenberg. And in large part, that is the way that people talk about music, as if listening is a thing that occurs later, a thing that occurs after the fact, once the music already has meaning and its meaning has already been created, as opposed to the way that uh, Tia Denora and some others write about music, where listening is an event that takes place and creates its own meaning. And that is how we make meaning as listeners and as musicers. So as Tia Denora writes, music analysis that tells us about the music itself is insufficient as a means for understanding musical affect, for describing music's semiotic force in social life. You'll notice that we have here um, a picture of myself and my dog, and I am holding, I happen to be holding uh, a copy of Tia Denora's book, Music in Everyday Life, and I'd like to make a quick point about the images that you've seen so far. We saw an image of uh, myself and my dog, and I happened to be holding a copy of uh, Christopher Small's book, Musicking. Uh, then I talked about Derrida, but I didn't have the book, so you just saw an image of myself and my dog, and then now, as I said, you see myself shirtless uh, and my dog, and I happen to be holding a copy of the book. When I was taking the two first images that you saw, I noticed that I was wearing um, a t-shirt that had a registered logo on it. Uh, and I got a little bit nervous about uh, including those images in there um, because I you know, thought it uh, might be like a logo infringement or copyright infringement or something. Um, so to take the rest of the images uh, for my presentation, I took my shirt off uh, when I was taking the rest of the pictures. And that, that brings me actually to my final point today, which is the copyright law can be very difficult to understand. Um, so we have here... Right, it's, a, it's a nice picture. Uh, we, we have here, if I do say so myself, uh, we have here an image of my apartment window. Um, I happen to be in the frame, shirtless, uh, with my dog, and I happen to be pointing at an image of the composer Arnold Schoenberg on my computer. Um, so you'll note that um, I've been talking to you for about 13 minutes now. Uh, I've given you a history of two and a half centuries of music technology. I've discussed three different recordings. Um, I've talked at great length about uh, one specific composer, and I haven't yet played you any audio files, and I won't. And, and the reason for this is that I live in fear of copyright infringement in the way that some people live in fear of heights or spiders. Uh, copyright law is still, a, it's quite a difficult thing to understand, and there's this thing called fair use that is kind of ill-defined and still argued back and forth uh, in courts today. And the reason that copyright law is difficult for me to understand is that it's something that treats music like a noun. It doesn't treat music like a verb. Uh, I would have loved to have played you uh, the recording of you know, Duke Ellington's arrangement of the Star Spangled Banner live at Newport 1953. Uh, I would have loved to play you some Schoenberg. No, I, never mind, I wouldn't have. Um, <laughs> But I, I would have loved to, tr to try and enact some of these things that I'm talking to you about, about this creating different meanings in music through listening. Um, but the second that I did that, as far as people who are responsible for copyright law are, are concerned, I would have used an object, right? I would have brought an object into the space and used it, as opposed to what I believe I would be doing, which is enacting a verb and getting us all to do something together. So it's unfortunate, but I do think that while our technology has caught up with our ideas and we can now listen to music anywhere at any time and can finally create these rich, different meanings about music recordings, I don't think that our laws have caught up there, which is unfortunate. And I'm now going to end my talk, uh, as any good law-abiding speaker should, uh, by making sure that I cite my sources, because we know that that's always important. And uh, just as a bonus, you get another image of my dog. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>